Hello and welcome to another episode of Unworthy History. Today we got some more actual history for you from this book right here, The Adventures of Bigfoot Wallace, the Texas Ranger and Hunter by John C. Duvall. This book was published all the way back in 1871. Now in the last episode in this series on Bigfoot Wallace, he met up with a curious specimen named Jeff Turner. His family had been killed by Indians, and he now swore a vendetta against them. So now we'll see what happens as Bigfoot Wallace, Jeff Turner, and the others are tracking Indians who had stolen their horses. About half an hour before sundown, Jeff Turner came to a halt. And when we had all gathered around him, he told us to keep a sharp lookout and make no noise as the Indians were close by. And in fact, we had scarcely traveled 300 yards further when we saw their blanket tents in the edge of some post oak timber, about a quarter of a mile to our right. We put spurs to our horses, and in a few moments we were among them. The Indians didn't see us until we were within 50 yards of their encampment, but still they had time to seize their guns and bows and arrows and give us a volley as we charged up. But luckily, no damage was done, except slightly wounding one of our horses. We dismounted at once and commenced pouring a deadly fire into them from our rifles. Just as I sprang from the saddle to the ground, a big Indian stepped from behind a post oak tree and drew an arrow upon me that looked to me as long as a barber's pole. I jumped behind another tree, as spry as a city clerk in a dry goods store, when a parcel of women come around shopping and not much time had I to spare at that, for the arrow grazed my head so closely that it took off a strip of bark from it about the width of one of my fingers. I leveled my rifle and drew a bead upon him as he started to run, but his arrow had rather unsettled my nerves, and I missed him fairly. The fight was kept up pretty hotly on both sides for fifteen or twenty minutes, when the Indians soured on it and retreated into a thick chaparral, leaving seven of their warriors dead upon the ground. I noticed Jeff Turner several times during the fight, and each time he was engaged in lifting the hair from the head of an Indian that either he or someone else had shot down. They say that practice makes perfect, and it was astonishing to see how quickly Jeff would take off an Indian scalp and load his rifle in readiness for another. One slash with his butcher knife and a sudden jerk, and the bloody scalp was soon dangling from his belt. At the same time, he never seemed to be in a hurry, but was as cool and deliberate about everything he did as a carpenter when he is working by the day and not by the job. When the Indians began to retreat, one of them jumped on one of our horses, which they had tied hard and fast to post oaks near their camp, forgetting, in his hurry, to unfasten the rope, and round and round the tree he went until he wound himself up to the body, when just at that instant Jeff plugged him with a half-ounce bullet and had his scalp off before he had done kicking. After they had retreated to the chaparral, a little incident occurred that shows the pluck of these Indians when they have been brought to bay. We were standing all huddled up together, loading our rifles, for we did not know but that the Indians had retreated on purpose to throw us off our guard, when all at once we were startled by a keen yell and the firing of a gun, and at the same instant a tall chap, who had come with us from the settlement, dropped his rifle and clapping his hands to his face, cried out, Boys, I'm a dead man! I looked around to see from whence the shot had come, and discovered an Indian lying on the grass about thirty yards off with his gun in his hand, slowly sinking back upon the earth again, from which he had partially raised himself by a dying effort to take a last pop at the enemies of his race. I had seen this Indian fall during the fight, and supposed, of course, that he was dead, as he was, in fact, an instant after he gave the yell and fired his gun, for I went up immediately to where he lay, and found that he was dead as a doornail, with his gun still tightly clasped in his hands. And yet at the same time he fired, he had no less than seven rifle balls through various parts of his body, for the wounds were plainly to be seen, as he had nothing on to speak of except his powder horn and shot pouch. Jeff Turner came up to him about the same time I did, and lifted the hair from his head before you could say Jack Robinson and strung it on his belt to keep company with three other scalps that were already dangling from it. 
The scalp seemed to ease the mind of Jeff considerably, as he told me they would, and he got quite sociable with the boys after the fight, and once actually laughed outright when one of them told a funny story about shooting at a stump three times for an Indian before he discovered his mistake. But either the unusual sound of his own laugh frightened him, or else he had used up all his stock on hand, for I never saw him crack a smile afterward. As it turned out, the boy who had been shot was worse scared than hurt, for the Indian's bullet had only grazed his head, but striking the blackjack tree near which he was standing, it had thrown the rough bark violently into his eyes, the pain from which led him to suppose that he was a dead man. The Indians had killed a fat buck, and when we pounced upon them they had the choice pieces spitted before the fire, and after the fight we found them done to a turn. We hadn't eaten a bite all day, and seized upon the venison as the lawful spoils of war, and made a hearty supper upon it, together with some hard tack which we had brought along with us in our haversacks. While I was eating supper, I couldn't help feeling a little sorry for the poor creatures who had cooked it only half an hour before, and who were now lying around us cold and stiff on the damp grass of the prairie, so soon to be devoured by vultures and coyotes. However, this thought didn't take away my appetite, or if it did, a side of roasted ribs and about five pounds of solid meat disappeared along with it. As soon as we had finished supper, we changed our saddles from the horses we had ridden to those the Indians had stolen from us, which had been resting for some time, and mounting, we took the trail back towards the settlement, where we arrived about sunup of the next morning, making 75 miles we had traveled in part of a day and night, without ever getting off our horses except for a few moments when we fought the Indians. Jeff Turner left us here for his camp on the Chicolite, and I never saw him again. I was told when I was at the settlement several years after this that he stayed around there for a good while, occasionally coming into the settlement for his supplies of ammunition, etc., and always bringing with him four or five scalps. At length, he went off and never returned, and it is supposed that the Indians finally caught him napping. At any rate, that was the last that was ever seen or heard of Jeff Turner. So that was the end of this story from The Adventures of Bigfoot Wallace. However, I found this article written by J. Frank Doby and published in Southwest Review back in 1955 that gives a little more info about the fate of Jeff Turner after this. Not much is down in writing about Jeff Turner, but in frontier households his name was once familiar. Many white people considered him a monomaniac, which he was. Indians looked upon him as a devil, which he was also. Turner had come to Texas from Kentucky and settled on the Guadalupe River with his wife and three small boys. One day he came in from a hunt to find all four dead and Indians scalping them. He killed four Indians that day and after that lived for the one purpose of killing and scalping more Indians. He could be counted on to join any expedition against them, but habitually hunted and waylaid alone. His type was rare, but he had precedents. Mad Ann Bailey of Virginia, who lived from 1747 to 1825, was perhaps the most noted. After her husband was killed by Indians, she lived only to avenge. Charles Goodnight used to tell of coming one rainy night upon a solitary frontiersman in his cabin, carrying a freshly taken Indian scalp over the fire, in retribution for a daughter killed by Indians while she was suckling a baby. This man cherished a collection of these well-preserved trophies. Any dedicated hater is a warped abnormality. The haters represented by Jeff Turner are not to be classed among those murderous scalpers for bounty, led by Santiago James Kirker and John Glanton, who in Chihuahua and Sonora collected not only on Apache scalps, but also on equally dark hair from innocent Mexican citizens. How many scalps Jeff Turner got before he died, I have no idea. How he died is in the realm of tradition. One December night in 1932, while I was in a hotel in El Paso, a vigorous knocking made me jump to my feet. When I opened the door, the frame was filled with man, over six feet of him, all in powerful proportions, wearing an enormous western hat, not at all disproportionate to the wearer. The man was Frank Collinson, now dead. 
In the early 70s, he had come from England to Texas, where he took with gusto to mustanging, buffalo hunting, ranching, and other forms of open-range life. He had a background of reading and the perspective of civilization, and in his latter years he wrote considerably for Western magazines. That night, before he sat down in a big chair in my hotel room, he began talking. After a while, he asked if I had known Bigfoot Wallace. I hadn't. He had on the Medina River west of San Antonio, where Bigfoot batched alone. Did you ever hear of Jeff Turner? Frank Collinson asked. Yes, I replied. I've read about him in Duval's book on Bigfoot Wallace. Does the book tell what became of Jeff Turner? No, and I have often wondered. Well, Bigfoot told me. He said that Turner kept on hounding Indians, picking off one when he could, and saving his scalp until one night they found him out in the brush asleep by himself. He was too valuable to kill right there, so they took him to their camp where the wife of a chief was soon to give birth to a baby, a boy they hoped. They spread eagle Jeff Turner on the ground and sat this chief's wife down beside him. Then the chief cut out Turner's heart, and while it was still palpitating, gave it to his wife to eat hot and raw. The belief was that Turner's bravery would thus be transferred to the unborn child. When I heard this story, I understood why Duval, who belonged to the Victorian age, and who wrote his books originally for publication in a magazine for boys and girls, did not tell what became of Jeff Turner. But maybe that's just a story. Then again, maybe it's a fact. So that's the end of this story, really a two-part story along with the last episode in this series I'm doing on Bigfoot Wallace. So we can see that eventually the Indians caught up with Jeff Turner and they got their revenge on him. So if you want to see some other episodes I've done that are sort of similar to this, you can look at my episode on the Joy family where Wiley Joy sort of turned into a similar character as Jeff Turner after his family members had been killed by Indians. And you can also see a similar case of Geronimo after his family was killed by Mexican soldiers back around 1860 or so. He had a similar vendetta against them. So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.